What's going on everybody? It's Gideon from Mana Entertainment and I'm here today with a special invitation that I got from Google to go to the Google Sandbox here in Orlando, Florida. It's the first time they did it there. It's the first time I've ever gone to a Google Sandbox event. And I will just say that I'm going to show some of the keynote speeches that we had and uh, hopefully I'll put some subtitles and stuff so you guys can hear it. But also, I just wanted to let you guys know, I'm not going to do a lot of talking throughout this video. I'm just going to share what, what was there. And just um, wanted to say that if you guys are interested in working for Google, I think this video will definitely push you over the edge to want to work for there because I went in not expecting to look for work, just kind of looking for networking opportunities to meet a new programmer to finish, you know, Space Exodus and everything like that. And I left wanting a job at Google. So... <laughs> Yeah, they pretty much convinced me, and I'll let you hear what, what they had to say for, your, for yourself, and hopefully they'll convince you too. I think Google is an amazing place to work for. They have a really cool culture, very awesome vibe. Everybody that I met was friendly, nice, down to earth. They were my kind of people, so hopefully you guys enjoy the video, and thanks for stopping by. Get in for Man Entertainment. Here comes the intro, and then right after that, bam, video time. Gmail, Maps, 
navigation and uh, YouTube has uh, been integrated into everybody's life and uh, they are free and they are available for people all around the world. And uh, also, this service, this scope has been expanded. For example, search has been used for uh, facilitating job search. They have been used in uh, crisis response. Other subsidiaries of Google Alphabet have invested more directly into uh, resolving challenging global issues such as the bridging the education gap in developing countries, um, helping train um, low-skilled workers and connecting them to high-quality jobs, um, bringing health data into actions, all this stuff. It's fair to say Google has been looking out for ways to improve everybody's life. Mm. So, so everybody in the Google community is contributing either directly or indirectly into these Google initiatives. So take the my team as an example. Our service is crucial for Google's own revenue, but it's also very important for businesses and organizations around the world. So actually, um, a lot of businesses rely on Google services to reach out to their clients, understand them and make the business decisions. So once I can make a connection from between my work and Google's initiatives, it's much easier to justify my efforts. This is important, mm. especially for a states so where I feel disappointed or um, unsatisfied or frustrated. So being able to make this connection is actually um, make me feel like I'm connected to something bigger. So I feel better for all the efforts I have spent. So um, second, um, Google tries me to be a better professional and personal self. So um, majority of my career is developed at Google. So all my domain expertise about scalability, about fault tolerance, about how to build a smooth user journey, I can learn in Google. Google. At Google, I actually learned other softer skills too, such as how you actually communicate with the stakeholders, how do you drive some difficult conversations. But the most important concept I learned at Google is the growth mindset. So growth mindset is not a concept invented at Google. Uh, it's actually derived from a long-term research um, conducted by Stanford professor Carol Dweck. So this professor's research team find out the underlying belief people have um, about some basic abilities such as intelligence or like talent actually greatly determine how they respond to setbacks and therefore determine their long-term success. So while on one hand, this is a fixed mindset. In a fixed mindset, people believe their basic qualities such as their intelligence or talent are simply fixed traits. So they just spend time to document their talents and abilities, but they do not like to face challenges and failures. Um, on the other hand, there is a growth mindset. People in this mindset, people believe their most basic abilities can be de developed through dedication and hard work or some better strategy. So, mm -hmm. so like this is uh, for people with a fixed mindset, they cannot face failures because they feel like they have no way to improve upon them. Right, but right. people with a uh, gross mindset, they have to work on challenges. They take a feedback as a way to improve instead of criticism. So they mm. usually are able to achieve much higher than they would when they, when they start from. So this actually applies to business as well. For a organization with a growth mindset, they usually uh, believe talents can be developed. A leadership can emerge and the innovation and the measure uh, risk taking are actually encouraged. So Google did not invent this concept, but it's fair to say 
in real estate. So mm. on the business side, Google usually encourages uh, innovations and uh, measure the risk taking. So we Google probably has more failed projects than succeeded ones, but it never stopped uh, trying. By basically it's the moonshot projects, which consists of set of projects. Um, they try to tackle the uh, very challenging global issues and they are not related to Google's core business and they are in very expensive, although you know we still try to invest on them. The whole company would, is also encouraged to have the moonshot thinking. So it's never good enough to have the Improvement. We are always encouraging to have the 10x, shooting for 10x better. Mm. So, also on the um, culture side, Google is failing for me too. We have had global outages um, because of human mistakes, but nobody has been fired. Instead, nice. <laughs> we take the postmodern philosophy, Very nice. we treat every outage as an opportunity to examine our vulnerabilities and make a plan to reduce the likelihood or the severity of recurrence. On the people management side, Google has been very forgiving as well. So low performers um, are encouraged to improve and they are actually given time, opportunities, and resources to work on. Mm. Um, we not simply let go of low performance. I think this is very different from many companies. So also during the course of my career, I also learned to apply this growth mindset to myself. So the research actually shows everybody has a mix of growth mindset and fixed mindset. And with me as an example. So I always have this growth mindset towards technology related stuff. So I like to take technical challenges. I like to, I also work on like code review or design reviews, uh, feedback, and I like to execute and uh, iterate. However, I didn't want to be a manager for a very long time. <laughs> I feel like uh, some managers, management seems like such a black box magic. And some people need to seem to be born with uh, um, better management. Skills. They are more patient, they are calmer, and somehow they just gracefully know, they just know how to gracefully manage up and manage down. But so I had this fixed mindset about being a manager. However, later on, for whatever reason, I had to be a manager. So I started looking, looking into this school. Um, so actually, now I took training classes and I talk to mentors. So once I can break down this management red box into four pillars, one is your domain knowledge, the other is your leadership in the team and your organization, and the third one is managing the cross-function relationship with your customers mm. and your upstream and downstream dependency. And then the last one is align align your initiatives with companies' initiatives. So mm -hmm. once I could break this thing into like four areas, it feels like much better. And it made me feel much better. It feels like this is something I can actually conquer. So now I am actually um, have much more confidence in doing a good job in the management as well. And also I apply this growth mindset to people around me. Of course, to my kids as well. Um, so I help them to enjoy the process um, as well as an end result and I help them to learn. I no longer say, you know, why is it not cannot attend from your spelling test? Instead, I try to <laughs> figure out why they make this mistake and how they actually prepare better the next time. Mm. So, um, all this aside, I think the, the takeaway is One's ability to learn and a, and a willingness to learn are far more important than what he or she already knows. Cool. And the Very third cool. one is Google strive to make a great managers. 
So personally, this is a big deal for myself. Um, so interestingly, Google didn't actually appreciate uh, management at the beginning. In the earlier years of Google, uh, leadership uh, engineers thought managers are uh, at best a necessary evil and uh, a layer of bureaucracy. So um, actually, I think Larry and Sergey decided to take out the all the managers for a few months. Of course, that was not predated me joining Google, but it was a disaster. So they had to do the managers plan. But how much manager matters um, will make the group a uh, great manager never ruin. We never, nobody understood them. So that plus a lot of engineers become manager directly. They are always often good people. They are always excellent engineers, but they don't have, they didn't necessarily have the mindset or skill to manage it. Mm. So the end result was at some point during the history of Google, the employee satisfaction uh, satisfaction rate towards the manager was very low. So my in that aspect. That's why I'm saying having good managers actually means a lot to me because mm -hmm. that experience was kind of traumatizing. I was yeah. saying that. But in 2008, Google figured that you know, we need to improve upon that. So we launched an um, uh, internal project called Proxnet uh, Project Oxygen. So I don't know if you, any of you heard that. So basically, their research started with the casting a uh, employee survey about their managers. And they did a, you know, they took the data-driven approach to analyze the survey results. So the data quickly revealed, revealed that managers do matter. And actually teams with great managers are just happier and they are far more productive. Mm. And uh, then the project actually took a, a step forward. It's a, so it summarized actually the best practice across all the high scoring uh, managers. And uh, they actually say they are this uh, a common practice that these managers usually do. And this list actually was expanded in subsequent years. Now we are looking at this uh, uh, 10 project author attributes. So the good managers tend to be inclusive empower the team better, they support the career development, etc. etc. Then when you look at this list, uh, it feels like it's uh, straightforward. Um, they may be even be kind of simple, right? But the trick is uh, how you actually put these uh, abstract uh, traits into practice. So actually property accident gives a very hands on um, hands on guidance uh, also they pinpoint the specific um, measurable behavior that every manager can follow. Mm. Um, so this practice is also included in the manager manager hiring and the training. So right now, I would say uh, the Google's management culture has been much improved. And two years after the project oxygen, um, the employee satisfaction rate actually went from 58% to 78%. Nice. Uh, I, Very nice. I can certainly feel the managers in my organization have improved so much from you know seven or eight years ago, and now they are kind of managers plus mentor and plus friends. So naturally, has it's a big deal for me personally. So I'm um, for the time being, that's all I would have a chance to talk about. Um, the last thing is, uh, I, I feel it's fortunate for me to have a job which is still inspiring after so many years. Um, I wouldn't say I will stay for Google forever, but uh, all the things I learned at Google will benefit me for a long time, even if I leave. Um, thank you. Some local talent. Uh, as Rosa mentioned, I am in the privacy consulting work and I am a manager, so as Dr. Wei alluded to, I'm a necessary evil in this organization. <laughs> I've been at Google for a couple of months, I'm still going up to speed, and I'd like to talk to you all about user privacy. 
I was told not to walk in front of this, but if I follow the instructions, I wouldn't be a cool doing that. <laughs> now, before I get into the day-to-day -day of my role, I want to talk a little bit about my journey to Google, and I hope that it resonates with some of you, and that way we can find something to connect with. So that's me. I'm my baby. One of my three babies. That's my beast. I'm nice. from the Bronx, New York, originally, and Woo! my first career was as a professional <laughs> chef. After high school, I went to culinary school, and I worked in restaurants and country clubs for four years. Before I enlisted in the Marine Corps, and my recruiter said, you're not doing that anymore. <laughs> I'm pretty grateful to him because he told me I would be doing IT, and here I am 12 years later still doing it. Cool. I am also the Area Center 1 for Toast, Director for Toastmasters International, so if you're interested in public speaking and leadership, come talk to me. I would love to indoctrinate you. I mean, talk to you about it. <laughs> <laughs> and there's some other information here that's not super important. The station, the campus gym, the BS, and that's blah, 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 blah. And Rosa already went through my entire resume, so I'll just <laughs> move on. So, up here you see the mission statement for Privacy Consulting. This is the team that Rose and I are involved on. I'll read it to you verbatim. The PDPO makes it easy for teams across the company to deliver world-class products that treat users with profound respect when it comes to controlling and understanding their data. I don't know what that sentence means, but I will tell you that my team's job is to make sure that every feature, service, hardware product that comes out of Google respects the way that we collect, store, use, and dispose of your data. Every time you use Google Maps, Google Search, you click on an ad, there is something about you that is collected. That's just how the ecosystem works. Yeah. And we are the group of people that make sure that you're not doing something evil with the data that we take from you. There are many parts of privacy consulting. I'm going to speak about three today, and we can get more in depth after the talk. There are internal privacy policies, privacy review, and privacy design and consultations. Most of these are fairly self-explanatory. Internal policy, poly, internal privacy policies are when our team sets policies for how the rest of the company can use your data. Now, we do this by relying on market trends, everything that's happening out against our competitors and all of our, our colleagues and things like that. But the basic underlying philosophy is we don't want Google to do something with your data that I wouldn't want a stranger doing it with mine. Mm -hmm. And that's the operating principle we use every morning when we come into work and we say, is this an okay thing to do? Yes, we can make more money this way. Yes, we're not breaking any laws. No, it's not a security violation. But if I found out that someone was using my data this way, how would I feel about it? What you find coming from that kind of environment is that there's a lot of gray areas, right? The way I think about the situation is different from the way that you might think about the situation. And so we try to find a common ground between the things that we can accomplish without getting too icky, if that makes sense. Now, one great thing about being on this particular is that we're one of the few teams that has full visibility over what the entire company is doing. As I mentioned before, every tool, service, feature, product goes through privacy review before it's released in public. So there are a few teams at Google that can say, I know what every team in this company is doing. Believe me, there are a lot of teams. Yeah. So that's the policy part. Privacy design comes when we work with product teams. When we have a team that says, product X exists in the world, and we think that Google can solve it. We want to do that by engineering, building some solution that will use X data to build Y solution. Now we sit with them before they program a single line of code and say, how exactly do you plan on accomplishing that? What data will you be using? How long will you keep it? How will you store it? How will you destroy it? Do the users know that you're going to be collecting the data from them and using it in that way? That's a lot of what the design and consultations are for. And if they're done well, they make the privacy review portion of our job very easy. As it may come as a surprise to most of you, the privacy review portion of our job is not usually very easy. This is after a product team has already built a product, and they're ready to release it to the public. And they say to us, is there anything here that we should be worried about? And we look at them and say, where were you during the privacy design of this product? And So, this is when we sit and take a look at the actual code that was written, probably using mock or test data, and see how it will interact with the data that that product will hopefully eventually be collecting from you. Mm. Next, I'd like to talk to you about what a day in the life of a privacy engineer is normally like. Can't tell, you. sorry, that's secret. It's all proprietary information. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm going to need you to imagine a funny meme here because I couldn't find one that would pass legal scrutiny. But I will tell you, I'm going to take a moment to talk about content creation. I was very deep in making this slideshow when I made this slide. And when I originally made it, it was a wall of text. And I said this 
entire slideshow to one of my fellow engineers, and he said, if these people wanted to read a book, they would have ordered it off of Amazon. So instead, there's a blank screen, I'm going to tell you what my day-to-day -day normally looks like. At the beginning of the day, you usually already have a set of meetings that you need to go to. You have some privacy design with some product team, a privacy review with another product team, a meeting with somebody somewhere to talk about some policy that they don't agree with, and they want to talk to you about it, even though you didn't write the policy, it's probably your first time seeing it too. That's fine. The entire point of what I'm trying to get across is there is a lot of context switching that happens throughout the day. You spend a lot of time meeting with a lot of different teams to talk about the different tools and products that they're coming out with. There are times when you get so lost in the conversations that you're constantly having with all of these different teams across Google that you need to take a step back and remind yourself of the core mission statement, the one that I mentioned earlier. At the end of the day, it's a matter of, are we doing the right thing with our users' data? They are trusting us since they are using our product. Let's not break that trust. And it's important for me to convey to you that there is a large group of people at Google whose entire job revolves around not breaking your trust with our products. That's me, that's Rosa, that's everyone in the room. I think I'm at the end of my presentation. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I hope that I was able to get across the importance and excitement of the work that we do in privacy engineering. Things are always evolving, as you know, as I mentioned earlier, it's mostly gray area. A lot of legal regulations haven't really caught up to the technology that involves collecting your data. Mm -hmm. And so we spend every day making judgment calls on, is this the right thing to do? And hopefully we're making the right calls. Thank you very much. <laughs> Speaking of balance, 
yes, I'm uh, as much a computer science engineer as a coach and mentor. I enjoy both science and nature. A fun fact about me, I'm also the assistant scoutmaster for a Boy Scout troop. Something I never thought I would do in my life. <laughs> over the last few years, I started volunteering and now I'm an assistant scoutmaster. Cool. So, some things about YouTube data. Um, I started building this, pipe, this, this little diagram like what goes into the system and what comes out of the system to, to give, give you guys an idea. And here you can see that it's a very interesting picture. So, where does data come from? Uh, when viewers like you or me, uh, we watch a video, we click like, we add a comment to a video, all of that data goes into the YouTube data system. Uh, similarly, when creators upload a video or you upload a family video, that data uh, is uh, and associated metadata, right? What is the video about? What is the description? Uh, what channel it belongs to? All of that goes into our systems. Analysts might be running some experiments. Like, uh, like an, an analyst might be running an experiment like if you change this button from red to green, you get better results. So some of that, like flags and other things, based on analyst questions are also passed into our systems. And the last thing is products. So just like Google products, YouTube has several products like YouTube TV, YouTube Kids, and each of these products has slightly different ways they represent their logs and data. And all of that data also goes into our systems. And then who uses the data? It happens to be the same set of people. So viewers see the number of times a video watched, the number of subscribers of a channel. Mm -hmm. Creators have their own view of YouTube where they can see analytics about their channel. Yeah. How many people are watching my channel in the last month? How many of them belong in this country versus that country? Analysts are always asking questions, trying to They help us improve our product. So the, the analysts generate information which uh, requires more data to be generated because then they have more questions. So the cycle goes back and that's how our day-to-day -day development goes forward. Hmm. And similarly, right, the products who put their data in want some information out of our systems, so they use the data as well. So what do I like about my job? Uh, what are the challenges I face? There are three main challenges I have listed here. And I'll try wow. to give you. Um, these are some users. stats that you can find on the YouTube website. We have over wow. 1 million users, 1 million hours watched daily. Uh, recently, most of our data is coming from mobile. Or most of our views are coming from mobile. Not mm. And mobile alone reaches more people in the US audience than any people. Wow. So all of this is, um, yeah, we, we, we create a system that works today, but keeping this in mind and the growing scale of YouTube, the system is updated very soon. So we have to all constantly keep in mind. The second one is that, um, just like Sean mentioned again, everything I learned in school, and some things I learned after school, I, I use all of them in my job. Um, these are, if you're a computer scientist or, or a software engineer, you would recognize some of these terms, hopefully most of them. Um, spam is not something that I learned back in school, but now it's a common term. I'm sure yeah. you, you know the problem, maybe you know what goes on behind it, but not the problem. And uh, what we have is these very complicated dependencies between all of these terms. Mm. We are dealing with this every day. Um, I should have put privacy in there. That's also a big part of it. Actually, that's probably my next step. Oh yeah, there it is. So, yeah, so people like Alex tell us you cannot compromise on privacy for clients. We fight, uh, but uh, that's the right thing to do for Google. Uh, and we together come up with uh, solutions that work for Google and work for the product. And how do we innovate in the presence of these things? So in uh, putting it in a different way, this is my last slide, what 
what do I do? These are some of the problems that I try to solve in my job, me and my team. Um, can analysts run pipelines themselves so that my team is not a problem? Like they don't have to call us and say, can you get the data ready for us? Can they do it themselves? Can we build a self-service system for them? Can we unify uh, different solutions for internal metrics or external metrics based on the requirements? Capacity planning, uh, as the data grows, we don't want to crash our systems every day, so we have to plan in advance. Uh, efficient spam collection, uh, we want to give people a good view of uh, the truthful views, sorry, the truthful uh, data about your view. If there are the people trying to pump up a video by some methods, we want to make sure that those counts are discounted. Mm. really, really great. 
So, uh, the video compression, what, is, what actually is video compression? It's, video compression is about making a high quality video taking as less space and as less bandwidth as possible. Mm. So, with consumer market shifted from a standard resolution video that, that was on DVDs up to HD video that's uh, also kind of obsolete these days, up to 4K UHD. Uh, that, that transition actually happened quite fast. Probably yeah. nobody, nobody already remember what DVD is. Well, somebody <laughs> probably, but nobody's using it anymore, quite frankly, right? So, uh, going from DVD resolution up to 4K requires Obviously, it's, it, it's about much more data, right? Yeah. And it requires much better compression methods. Uh, as for example, uncompressed 4K video uh, with 60 frames per second would require something about 15 gigabit per second cha uh, channel, which is obviously not available. While right. the properly compressed video takes about 10 to 20 megabytes per, uh, megabits per second. Which is, which is something that's currently available on the market. And the quality of these, vi of these videos should be, should be sound, should be fantastic. Yeah. And if you go to YouTube and select a, a video, a properly, properly made video in 4K resolution, you'll see that the quality is actually very good. Yeah. So, Achieving this requires some fairly sophisticated algorithms and using some complex maths from ranging from functional analysis, probability theory, uh, game theory, etc. As well as recently we are employing emergent technologies type, such as artificial intelligence and machine learning. Mm. Uh, that is very trendy now that helps to improve both quality and the compression speed a lot. So, and this is what my team works on. I really spent uh, some time trying to get into this team, trying to get to the best team in the field, which is Google's team uh, that is created, that's created a one technology. Uh, so, specifically about me, I'm working on this, uh, on this AV1 coin. Mostly my job is to speed it up, because good compression requires computational resources, uh, which is not always available. For example, if you are compressing a video for, for a YouTube, uh, you probably can spare some time to press it, but when you're making a video call, it's obviously not good if your phone is saying, okay, say something, then I'll see it a minute and then I'll send it uh, to your uh, to your counterpart. Uh, I mostly use C and C++, uh, also do some, some assembler, and as I mentioned, my job is, my work is open source, anyone can go take a look at crack on their own. <laughs> uh, and the last thing I would like to say, uh, as the previous speakers were saying, a lot of things, good things about working at Google. Uh, as you can see, I worked in a couple of countries before Google. There's one thing at Google that strikes me a lot. It's culture of openness between the management and the employees. We have a, a meeting almost every week, kind of a town hall meeting, where our top executives are coming and answering questions from the employees. Cool. So any employee can ask, can ask a question and there is a voting system, so anyone can vote, upload or download certain questions and almost every week 
uh, our CEO uh, stands in front of the audience and answers those questions. And there is no limit what could be asked. So uh, tough questions like why are we invested in this, and why we don't invest in this, and even tougher questions, where's our holiday gifts? <laughs> So I really cannot imagine this happening in any other company I work for. So this is a fantastic culture of openness at Google. And uh, I hope a lot of you guys try to join us in this journey. Thank you very much. I hope this was short enough so you enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Um, so uh, I just recorded all of these awesome uh, experiences that you guys had, and I have a YouTube channel. Is that okay to post it? <laughs> Am I too early in the question? Uh, oh yes. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I recorded all of the, you know, all the lectures that, oh, not lectures, but you know, the, the the things, the talks that you guys were doing, and I thought it would make a pretty cool YouTube video. So uh, do I have permission? <laughs> to post it. <laughs> 